is Harold Davis. I'm here to teach you about the art and craft of digital photography. Let's get this webinar cooking. In case you don't know much about what Harold does, Harold is a best-selling author of many books, including our new book, Creative Garden Photography from Rocky Nook. You can pre-order it if you like. Harold is the developer of a unique technique for photographing flowers for transparency. He pioneered multi-raw processing, hand HDR processing, as well as developing a technique to enhance images using the lab color space. Harold is a Moab master and a Zeiss ambassador. He is an internationally known photographer and a sought after workshop leader. If you would like to see more of what he does, please visit him at his website, digitalfieldguide.com. Now, I am going to hand the microphone over to Harold. Are you there? Hi, Phyllis. It's, hey so, nice. it's so nice to listen to you this morning and you do such a wonderful job here. It's, I'm really proud of it. Oh, thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, LAB color is a topic that is really dear to my heart, my photographic heart, and uh, a very interesting topic, wide, not very widely known. Um, it's both quite technical in uh, quite technical in nature, and also. Uh, quite easy to use in some respects too. So we're going to have a wide flow of uh, ideas and techniques here. I can't get into what LAB does in Photoshop and how it works without explaining some of the basics about color spaces and how color spaces work. So we'll be doing that. And as Phyllis noted, I'll be also using Photoshop besides a slide presentation and as well as the uh, whiteboard facility that Zoom makes available. I think we'll find that having me klutz through the whiteboard thing is uh, going to be interesting, uh, virtually speaking. The I, in person, when I give an in person uh, a workshop, I'm enough, the, the, the propeller head in me has enough of a remnant that I love doing things on the whiteboard. So I'm a real whiteboard fanatic. In fact, you know, when I, uh, when, when I was the uh, CTO, the chief technology officer at a startup, one of the first things I did was I took a room, turned it into the sort of war room and lined it up with whiteboards. So I, I love whiteboards, virtual ones, maybe not so much. But anyhow, we'll, we'll see how that works. Uh, I, I'm really glad you're here today. LAB is fun. Using it creatively is more than fun. And with that said, I'm going to share my screen and get started on the presentation. Thanks, everyone. So this presentation um, will have the basics of LAB color. Excuse me, here we just are arranging our deck here. And here's the table of contents, basically, of what we're gonna cover. So, after I show you some images, and the images are the motivational space, here's why you do it. I can talk about them a bit and uh, explain how, what the relationship to LAB of, of the images is. I'm going to um, explain how color spaces work. I'm gonna look at the color settings in Photoshop and explain what you need to know to set the color spaces in Photoshop right. In between those two bullet points is going to come the famous uh, whiteboard part, incidentally. And um, we're going to convert to LAB. We're going to sharpen in LAB, which is a very interesting exercise. It's my favorite form of sharpening for visual emphasis. Uh, 
as a quick preview, the reason for uh, sharpening an LAB is that LAB separates out grayscale information as opposed to uh, color information. So you can sharpen just the black and white information in a photo. The thing that looks unattractive when people over sharpen is typically that the color information in an image has got sharpened. That usually doesn't work very well. So the ability to just operate on the grayscale part of an image is hugely powerful when it comes to sharpening. We're gonna talk about LAB inversions. We're gonna talk about LAB equalizations. In fairness, what I'm going to do in this webinar is show the basics of those two operations because um, there's a lot that can be said, particularly once you combine inversions and equalizations with Photoshop blending modes that is going to be covered in the second installment of this webinar a week from today on um, next Saturday at the same time, same bat channel. So. I'm also going to show you how to download, install, and use the piece of software I wrote many years ago to go with uh, the Photoshop Darkroom book, the first Photoshop Darkroom book. It's gone through a couple of versions and improvements since then, but the uh, piece of software was originally written to go with that book. It's free to download. I released it into the wild without charge and it helps working with LAB a great deal. I'll show how it works, and, but please do understand that I'm, that I'm not out to do software support. So kind of, how do we say this? You're on your own with it once you decide to use it. Promise you it won't wreck your computer, but that's my sole warranty. I, I feel that uh, working with LAB is truly a magical operation and once you know how to do this you know something that most other people don't know about post-production so what i say when i do this in a human living workshop is keep it to yourself and use it for your own work it's too powerful and magical to spread widely there are secrets that are coming ahead Creative destruction, great thing. It's part of creativity. You can't make things without breaking things. This is a LAB construction and composition in uh, Photoshop. Photography is applied design. Photography is design. It's also a technical field. The image was originally taken. It's of a Bougainvillea bract. It was taken, as you see on the left-hand side, on a, a light box white background. The image on the right is the LAB L channel inversion of the image on the left, and the two versions of the same image are combined with some Photoshop curves and manipulations in the center. I created this image on a light box as a kind of medieval manuscript, and so what I like to do when I do light box compositions is often create a twofer, invert the L channel and create a sort of dark companion to the light version. Now, sometimes a version doesn't work so well dark, sometimes it's better dark. It really, the situation depends a lot on the individual image. Something like this image, I prefer the white version, which I, called uh, illumination. It looks to me like a page from an illuminated manuscript made in flowers. But you know, the, the one on black has a certain striking presence too. With this single flower image, I really like the one, the inversion, which you see here, the L channel inversion, perhaps better than the original, but the original is a simple image and it, it, has, its, uh, it has its place too. This is a complex image in post-production, not a simple one. What you see on the, uh, of the flowers is both an L channel inversion and an LAB channel inversion. So there are two different LAB inversions here combined on a virtual sheet of paper placed on a background that I photographed somewhere else in this wide world 
with uh, thumbtacks that were virtually photographed into it. Here's another image that it consists of two different uh, LAB versions of a of a Gallardia, a blanket flower uh, photographed on a light box. This is a fairly widely, uh, fairly widely used and known image of mine of a clematis from the clematis vine that uh, uh, hangs over our front gate. Beautiful, beautiful flowers come off this. And it began life as an image like this, as a photograph on white, which is, I like, but it comes into its own as an LAB inversion. Here's another playing around with an L-channel inversion a and a straight version. The simplest part of the construction here, and I'm not going to claim this is a simple piece of post-production because it was not, but the simplest part of it is the uh, LAB moves. And here again, you have another uh, photographed on white and the same image inverted onto black. White, black. I photographed this pattern of flowers with the idea of creating an infinitely repeating series. It could go on forever. This is, these are nine panels in here with the image rotated each time. So here you have a B channel uh, equalization in LAB of the same image, the same pattern in blue and you have an A-channel equalization here. So these are two different adjustments in LAB of the same original image. So you can take a photograph of a model like this, a simple photograph, and you can go to monochrome with it, and then you can create an equalization in LAB like this, and you can do another one, an inversion in LAB like this. The idea here is that LAB is a palette of possibilities. By the way, I keep saying LAB. Um, technically speaking, that's what it is. It's not lab color. The temptation when you see the letters L, A, and B is to say lab, and if you do, I'm not going to be the one to chastise you. I don't care so much about naming things as I do about understanding them. But from the point of view of Puris, uh, it's LAB color. And it's worth noting that LAB is really a uh, scientific way to designate color that's part of the background. We'll, we'll get into more of that in a moment. Here's a pretty simple photograph that I made of a white uh, pedestrian arrow on the walkway of the Bay Bridge going over from Oakland, California to Treasure Island with shadows of a gate coming through it. So here's a inversion of the same image. It's also reversed. Interesting things start to happen when you do, uh, this is a B channel equalization in LAB color of the same arrow. And this is a composition that's created from applying the various LAB adjustments and using Photoshop blending modes to make more of the same. Here's a Coca-Cola can. I don't drink the stuff anymore, as people have rightly said. It's kind of poison, but I do like the way it tastes. Actually, I don't drink sugar anymore, but okay. Leave that aside. This Coke can was sitting in our recycle bin and it rained. So I photographed it with raindrops in the recycle bin. Here's a Here's a A-channel inversion of the Coke can. In an A-channel inversion in LAB, what happens is that you swap red for greens and green for reds. <laughs> well, you know, you can get pretty funky with this stuff. Who'd believe that this thing came from a simple Coca-Cola can? And, and so on. The thing is that when you have a palette of color possibilities, from an artistic viewpoint, the question is where do you stop and what do you do with them? Here's reflections that I shot a number of years ago in the uh, skyscrapers in downtown Oakland, California. If you're not from this area, you may not realize that Oakland is a uh, 
pretty big city in its own right. It's um, it's uh, the one of the big venture capital centers in the world. It's it's the third largest port on the west coast of California. It's got it's famous for various things, but um, it's also got a real downtown. So here are a couple of straight photos from downtown Oakland, curvature in a fancy office building. And you begin to play with them in LAB. You can get images like this and like this, or blue if you prefer, and take it away and get even more complicated. These are marine life photographed piece by piece put through LAB moves and recombined a model, a B channel equalization of the same model. Images like this, as I said, re remind me of what you do with film negatives to positives. Okay, so let's, let's uh, get some understanding of what we're talking about a little more. Here's a color space diagram. You'll see that the smallest space in there is the uh, sRGB space. Hold that thought for a second. Somewhat larger than it are various other RGB spaces. There's a CMYK color space, and that's pretty large compared to the smallest RGB spaces. And larger than all of these is the LAB space. So hold this thought for a second while I, uh, while I get out of my presentation and go to the uh, virtual whiteboard facility. We'll see how that works. Okay, I think, I think we see a whiteboard. Let's, let me get a brush. Let me get a format tool. We're gonna pick red to start with, and I'm gonna draw a small circle like this. I'm gonna put a text box in the middle here, and I'm gonna say this is S R G B. I don't quite know why the text put it in blue. Let me see what I can do to put it back into into red. Format red. Okay. So what is sRGB used for? <laughs> it, it's used on the internet when you upload a photo to Flickr or to Instagram or to a blog or display it anywhere, uh, typically where people don't know what gamut of display device you have. Uh, it's in sRGB. I just use the word gamut, by the way. It's a fancy sounding word and I love it. But what gamut means is how many colors are in a color space. That's also sometimes called the width of the color space. So sRGB is one of the lowest gamut color spaces known to humanity. Otherwise known is it's a crappy color space. You didn't hear that word, but it's not, a, it's, it's a low width color space. The idea is that since it's going to be up on the internet and you have no idea where it's going to be displayed, is it going to be on somebody's phone? Is it going to be on some monitor that was uh, made 20 years ago? One just doesn't know. So it has to be a kind of lowest common denominator thing. And therefore it contains the fewest colors. What, what is clear in working with color is that what you need to do is to maintain as high a gamut color space as long as possible. That's principle number one. You keep as high a gamut color space as long as possible. This has an implication for the color settings and applications such as Photoshop and Lightroom, and we'll go into that in a minute. The other principle is that if there is going to be a conversion between color spaces, you want to be the one responsible for overseeing that conversion so that you can fix things if there is any trouble. So let me draw in a larger color space. I'm going to pick a different color this time. Let me pick uh, this one, whatever it is. Oops, I want to draw, not 
text. Nope. So let's clear that. Nope. Okay. Now we're going to try again. Okay, good. That's better. And this is a little bit of a bigger gamut color space. This one is Adobe RGB. So Adobe RGB is a lot better than sRGB, and it's the default in much of the world for the RGB color space that you're going to see. By the way, uh, what is RGB generally used for? I explained it's used for being reproduced on monitors. It's also used when you, uh, for the most part, when you print something in your house, when you send it off to Blurb, it's going to be an RGB. RGB, and you probably are going to be working in RGB in Photoshop or whatever other uh, program you use for image manipulation. Okay, so there's Adobe RGB. It's a better choice than sRGB, but it's not the widest gamut that you can have in RGB. Let me draw um, a, the, the best gamut to be working in in um, in Photoshop, do you think that I actually have a purple brush now? Yes, I do. Astounding. Okay, so this is Pro Photo RGB, and I need to get the color back to purple. Uh, So all things being equal, this is the color space that you should be working in when you, um, when, you, when you start working in Photoshop or Lightroom is Pro Photo RGB. When it comes in from your camera, you should be taking it in in Pro Photo. If you, this is by no means gonna be the default setting in any of these programs, so you actually have to go and set it that way. And we're gonna look at how to do that in Photoshop in a minute. In Lightroom, it's in the preferences. Um, if you take it in, in sRGB, the colors, the differential in the colors between sRGB and Pro Photo RGB are gone, and they're gone forever. You can't actually say, I'm going to get it back just by switching to Pro Photo RGB. So keep as high a gamut color space as you can as long as possible. Now let's, uh, now let's throw another kind of color space into here. Um, let's see what I can do to get another color up. Let's try orange. Okay. Um, Harold, Joe has a question. Joe, just hold on one sec. Let me just see if I can figure out how to put an orange text box in here to indicate it, and then I'll be very happy to address the question. Okay, go ahead, Joe. Uh, Joe or wants <laughs> me and Joe. Joe wants to know pro photo the impact of eight bit versus sixteen bit. Well, more bits is better. <laughs> you know, uh, you know there, there's a lot you can say about that. Technically, you want to be you want to be in 16 bit is the bottom line. Thanks, Joe. Uh, you know, someday perhaps people will be working in 32 bits. Mostly, for the most part, it's not really very practical or feasible at this point. There's a, it's a there, there's an exponential difference in the dynamic range of colors between 8-bit and 16-bit. So make sure your camera is set to the highest bit depth for recording color. Make sure it's brought in to Photoshop or Lightroom in 16-bit in Pro Photo RGB. So what's CMYK used for? CMYK is a different way of designating color. First of all, what I didn't say about RGB is that RGB stands for the three channels that exist in, in RGB color spaces, R, red, green, and blue. 
CMYK is cyan, magenta, yellow, and K is black. For some reason, since time immemorial, K has stood for the black channel in CMYK. Uh, CMYK is used for printing. When Phyllis and I send our new book, Creative Garden Photography, off to uh, Korea to be printed, the, um, it, it's going to go as a CMYK files. The gamut, there are, just as with RGB, there are more than one CMYK color space. In particular, if you're going to send it to a particular printer, they will give you the profile for what CMYK color space you want to use. The gamut of CMYK is roughly equivalent, depending upon the specific kind of CMYK, to the larger RGB color spaces. However, the, they're not, the Venn diagram does not exactly overlap. If you, if you notice here the way I've drawn it, there's, um, let, me, let me pick a different color here. Let me see, oh, we'll go back to red. Let's see, do I have this in red? Nope, I don't. Red, okay, I think we're good. So that space is the part of the part of RGB that does not overlap exactly with CMYK, and also there's a part over here that doesn't overlap too. So these non-overlapping parts are where the problem happens when you go between RGB and CMYK and CMYK and RGB. The um, so uh, everything else is just fine. There's never a problem in these areas when you convert between RGB and CMYK. It's only over here and over here. And in those places, you need to be very careful about how you, um, about how you do the uh, conversion. And in fact, you need to probably go back to the image and fuss with it to make it look right. That's where the bulk of the work comes into preparing files for printing on a, on a major printer. Oops, I have the wrong tool here. It's not what I wanted. I want this tool. And now I, oh, I keep doing it again. What am I doing? Okay, pick this, pick that. And I think we've got a line here. I am now rather badly drawing in uh, the line that represents LAB color. Okay. Okay. Well, you'll, for, you'll forgive my bad line. There we go. Let me put a text box in here. And we'll put LAB color. The point of all this is that LAB has a bigger gamut than any of the other color spaces. It's designed that way. It was designed by a consortium of scientists, of physicists and optical uh, scientists of, of various sorts in the 1930s. It's a theoretical color space in the sense that not every uh, color in it is actually viewable by humanity. We can't see some of the colors that can be specified in LAB color. These are called imaginary colors. And it cannot be reproduced per se. There's, there are almost no devices that accurately display LAB color. It is the color space used for technical color calculations by physicists, by those involved in astronomy and related fields. It's also used for color calculations under the covers in Photoshop. So there's a lot of behind the scenes conversion to LAB back and forth that happens in Photoshop. But it's not a practical color space in the sense that you can't set something into LAB color and then print it out on your printer or send it to someone to be printing. Fundamentally, if you're going to be working creatively in LAB, you're going to do a lot of round tripping into LAB from RGB to LAB and back to RGB, hopefully mostly pro photo. So I, I want to summarize this with a couple of things. One, more gamut is better. You want to keep as high a gamut color space as you can until you have to convert it down. 
Two, if there are going to be color conversions between color spaces or between versions of RGB, you want to be there for it. You want to be the one converting it from pro photo RGB down to sRGB for, for putting a JPEG up into the web. You don't want that to happen automatically based on Instagram's uh, algorithm for doing it because some, some percentage of the time it'll be fine, but some significant percentage of time it won't be fine. One, one other thing to think about are the channels. RGB has three channels, red, green, and blue. CMYK has four channels, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Well, LAB color has three channels, L, A, and B. And um, these color channels have a couple of unique and interesting properties. The L channel is the lightness channel, and it contains the light and dark information, all the grayscale information. The A channel is, um, goes from green to magenta, and the B channel goes from yellow to blue. So these color channels are what is called color opponent. The two parts of LAB that allow one to have so much creative fun are that the black and gr white and grayscale information are separated from the color information. So the A channel is completely distinct from the A and B channels and that each of these three channels are color opponent. In some ways you could think of this as a uh, shortcut way to introduce six kinds of color information into your images. Before I close out this, uh, this, this whiteboard drawing and move back for a little to a presentation and then into Photoshop, uh, I'd like to know if there are any questions here. Yes, there are. Inger has a question. He says, since the camera stores information in Adobe RGB, how is the gamma then expanded to pro photo RGB? That is a, a one, one great question, um, which I, I can't really give the technical answer to, but it is. There's an, some interpolation that happens when you enter it as pro photo into either Lightroom or Photoshop that, that adds width to the whole thing, to the gamut. And Barbara um, has a question. Uh, will there be a discussion on how to calibrate between lab, pro photo RGB and CMYK? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure I understand what calibration means there exactly. Certainly, we're, we're just about to get into a discussion about how to convert between them. Um, I think calibration really is for just from the printing and visual aspect, um, you can calibrate your monitor. You know, we have our dinguses that we can hang on the monitor to make sure that they're color calibrated correctly. So what you see is what you get, hopefully. Uh, the thing is with printing, you have a profile, a color profile that you um, apply to images so that your images use the same color space that the actual printing machine will be using. And we can, with our Epson 99 uh, printer here in Herald Studio, we can run uh, tests on that profile to see what the images will look like roughly, you know, as a proof before it gets to the book. But there's really no way to calibrate, you know, and so actually, when you do that with a print, and if it doesn't look like the way you want it, then you can go back and make adjustments and then reprint it again physically. But there's um, calibration between the three really isn't possible like, because they're three distinct areas, I think. To elaborate a little bit more, uh, the device people use to calibrate a monitors is a, is a photo spectrometer that you sit on top of the monitor and reads the light coming in. And the real idea there is to level the playing field. You don't want to be looking at something that is much yellower one day than the next day. Um, However, LAB color presents calibration difficulties for starters because it can't accurately 
be displayed and it certainly can't be printed. You can use a printer to print out color samples that can be, then be used to calibrate, but calibration is a form of normalization, really. It's to make sure that you have apples to apples and oranges to oranges when you compare things. The um, so, and that's really not something that's completely easy to do with with uh, uh, color spaces that are as different in definition as LAB and uh, the others. And it's also, I'm going to say frankly, not really my interest. Um, you know, I, you've seen some pretty wild images that I've put together using this technology. My interest is using technology to put together uh, interesting and exciting images, not to be a technical, uh, not, not to be a technical retoucher, basically. There, there are situations in which understanding how you calibrate back and forth between color spaces is really very important. But what, you know, making, making art out of them is probably not one of them. But still, it's a great question for understanding this stuff. While I'm going to knock down the whiteboard and, and move back to the presentation, which will take a minute or two, while I do, if there are any other questions, Phyllis, why don't you, uh, why don't you, not, why don't you shoot them at me? Yep, one more question from Seta. After working in lab color, to save it in a JPEG, you need to convert it to RGB. Does this mean you lose color information? Absolutely. Well, and there's the difference also between saving an image as, say, a Photoshop file, which would have a wider gamut than a JPEG file, which is really made for, you know, image uh, uh, viewing on a monitor or a screen. Yeah, so, I mean, that's a great question. These are great questions, by the way. The answer is absolutely yes, you're going to lose information. The, the, the question that becomes interesting is what information? because not all information is equal. You know, this, this reminds me of George Orwell's Animal Farm. I'm not quite sure why, you know, all pigs are equal, but some are more equal than others. Well, maybe it's politics that's making me think about that. But anyhow, uh, I'm not gonna go there. But so, yes, and the trick, both, both parts of the process that you mentioned, going from LAB, to some RGB space, hopefully back to Profoto. And then before you convert to JPEG, going from Profoto to sRGB, both of those um, moves inherently and necessarily involve the loss of gamut and some color information. That's why, um, that's why you wanna keep the, oops, oh, good grief, what happened there? Uh, Hold, hold, please. Um, okay. And actually, I have another uh, comment about the camera and the RGB and, and Profoto. Okay, well, let me just let me yeah, just finish sure. my thought before I forget my thought. What was that thought? <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's why you want to. That's why you want to keep the high gamut spaces where you work. Basically, in Photoshop, since the underlying color calculations are in LAB anyhow, you don't lose anything by going back and forth to LAB. So, in my workflow. Um, I, I've been known to go back and forth to LAB two or three or four times in a single image workflow by the time the image is at an end. Of course, sometimes, you know, I have a uh, hundred steps in an image processing for me. This can all take quite, quite a long time. So, uh, you know, but that said, you want to, if you're in LAB, you need to do the work in LAB. Then you convert back to Profoto RGB. Then at the end of the whole process, you create a master file. For me, I keep my master files in Profoto. If you kept them in Adobe RGB, that would not be a great sin. But you then from there, you make branches depending on what you want to do. If you're going to be going to a printer, um, and Phyllis is the one is the one of the two of us who keeps these. You do a CMYK version for the printing to the printer profile. If you're going to be going to make an art print, you print to the profile of the paper and printer you're going to be printing on, and you create a version for that. And if you're going to be putting them on the web at what at a particular size and resolution, first of all, you want to take the resolution way down, and you want to do the conversion to sRGB yourself so you can see if there are any problems. Uh, is, is, that, is that 
clear enough or are there any further questions about it? While we're thinking about that, I'm gonna get a sip of water. Okay, and I'm gonna fill in. It, this relates to Inger's earlier question. Mark says, I think camera only stores information in Adobe RGB for the JPEG, but not for the raw file. And I sat here with Ms. 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 Google. So when you shoot raw, you do not assign a color space to the image. That's Remember, right. this That's is a, exactly right. This That's is exactly raw right. sensor data. The color space is attached to the image at the time of development and output. If you output a raw file and create a JPEG or a TIFF, then the color space is attached to the image file. Thank you, Phyllis, and thank you, Ms. Google, and thank you for clarifying that. That's exactly the correct answer, that a raw file does not have color space tagged to it. So what you take it in is what the gamut you're going to get. So I guess you have to be careful how you have your camera set before you even take the photo. No, in RAW, it really doesn't matter, actually. Usually, you know, in my Nikon D850, there's a choice between JPEG, there's a choice between RGB and sRGB. That's really the only choice they give me. It turns out that for a RAW file, it makes no difference. It, the only thing that really impacts are a, if you're shooting a JPEG, and sometimes, you know, you can set it to shoot RAW and JPEG or just JPEG. And it also might impact the way the image looks in the LCD on the screen because it tags it with the color space, but no, no difference otherwise. Any, any further questions, thoughts about um, any of this complicated stuff? <laughs> There's a question from Seta. If you are printing at home and have worked in lab color in Photoshop, can you print it from the lab color? Yes, the an yeah, yes, the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the answer is no, because you have to no. convert it to, if you have a particular special paper you're using, for instance, we use the Moab papers, and each Moab paper has its own, what's called an ICC profile, and you can download those from the Moab site, and then that is a color space that the actual paper can use for the print. So you want to apply that color space, that profile to your print as you, you know, before you print on that paper. And that um, actually that profile tells the printer how much ink, for instance, that the paper can take because some like washi papers are so thin and light, they cannot take a huge uh, ink dump. You would have ink spreading all over the place and it would look awful. So, um, so that's, that's kind of the story on printing and ICC profiles. Just, um, yes, and just to clarify something, those ICC profiles that Phyllis is referring to are all RGB ICC profiles. Correct, that's so, correct. So generally the workflow, uh, as I've said before, involves doing the creative effects you, you start out in wide gamut RGB pro photo. You, at some point in your workflow, you head over to LAB, you do something fun in LAB. And then when you're through in LAB, you head back to RGB. I'll just say one more point about that because you know this will become clearer as we work through examples, particularly as we work through examples next week when, when things uh, get, get a little more complicated. Um, and that is, if you try to go between color spaces in Photoshop with a layered document, you're gonna get a nasty warning message. Are you really sure you wanna do this? We can't guarantee that the color values will be the same. I mean, it doesn't put it that way and it's not polite. It doesn't say, are you really sure? But, but that's what the message says. And so the point there really is that you have to conclude a move in the color space you're in before you go to the next one. Uh, part of my workflow is I keep uh, archived versions of everything before I layer down. So if I'm doing something in Photoshop that takes three or four layers, and most things take three or four layers at least, I save a version of that, I layer it down, and then I convert it back to RGB. And the same thing in RGB before I go to LAB. You need to be careful that your moves between color spaces are in with single layer documents. Okay, that'll become clearer as we as we take a look at some examples. Up on your screen, you should see a channel diagram in Photoshop. Okay. The 
L channel goes from white to black. At the midpoint, it's neutral gray. The A channel goes from green to magenta. At the midpoint, it's neither green nor magenta. At the, the B channel goes from yellow to blue. At the midpoint, it's neither yellow nor blue. This is, how can I put this as politely as Photoshop's messages? A little hard to wrap one's brain around, but you'll, you'll see how it works in practice. All right, let's go to Photoshop. Enough, uh, enough talk. Okay. Yeah, where, where are we? Here we are. And Ron had the question, what do you mean by color opponents? Um, well, you know, you put on a suit of armor and you go out and you start punching at the color. And, no, jousting uh, with the colors. No, with jousting so. with the colors. No, color, the phrase color opponent means that each channel contains a color and its opposite. For example, take the B channel. At the, at the highest value on either end of the B channel is yellow and blue. So yellow and blue are opposite colors on the color wheel, right? So that's what color opponent means. Okay, we have here a, let me get, let me get this stuff off my screen. We have here a fairly nice, um, gosh, not sure I remember what this flower was. Do you remember, Phyllis, what it was? Isn't it a blanket flower? I don't think so exactly. It kind of looks like one in the center, doesn't it? Yeah, Anyhow, it anyhow. If you've got you a botanist out there, you can tell us. Oh, it's an echinacea, Barbara says. She's right, absolutely. She's right. It's an okay. echinacea, a cone flower. Yeah. Um, Pink cone flower. Thank you, Carrie. So you look at the channels palette here, which I, which I have down. I'm wiggling my uh, mouse over the channels palette. In RGB, you can see that you've got red, green, and blue, right? Okay. So the color settings in Photoshop are, come on, come on Photoshop, be good, are down at the bottom of the uh, edit menu. So what you want to be careful about is the working spaces drop down lists in the color settings dialog, okay? By default, your settings will not look like this. They should, okay? So by default, most likely, it, you're gonna have sRGB, and technically speaking, it's not actually sRGB, it's sRGB IEC 61966-2.1, don't ask, okay? So it's not a terrible sin if it's Adobe RGB instead of Profoto, you, but you will lose a bit of gamut that way. Uh, you you want to make sure that your working space is set to RGB. Notice also that I have personalized the settings here. They're, they're mine. You do that using the save and you load because sometimes somebody else needs to use my computers they, or we may need to adopt them for a particular ICC profile. You can begin to see lists of, of some of the many other possibilities that are that are here under the, under the various kinds of uh, Profile. Well, actually, if you use my production machine, you see about 200 profiles there. You, um, generally, you want to preserve embedded profiles. It's actually a good idea to have the, your computer tell you if there are profile mismatches or if you have an image without a profile. So this is an important dialogue because what it really does is it sets up what, what are the defaults. You set this and then you open an image from your camera into Photoshop, it's gonna come in as Profoto RGB, okay? To can actually convert an image, you can either use the assign profile or better, the convert to profile dialog. This is the first place that you convert an image to LAB color. 
Um, when you use the convert to profile dialog and you're converting from pro photo RGB to LAB color space, you want to, first of all, I choose um, LAB from the drop down list here and it's higher up. It's, you note it's alone by itself. There's only one LAB. And you want to make sure that the engine is set to Adobe, not Apple, which is the other possibility here usually. And you want the intent to be relative colometric. And you want to check the use black point compensation box. Okay. Those are important settings, but the good news is that once you've done them once, um, then you don't have to go through them again because your previous settings are saved as the default and you can simply go image mode LAB color like this and it has the same impact, exactly the same impact as using the uh, convert to profile dialog. So let's go ahead and do the convert to profile. And I'll choose LAB here. Remember, my engine's at Adobe, my intent is relative color metric, and I have black point compensation checked. And the image looks just the same way, but if you look in the channels panel over here, you'll see that I have lightness A and B. Um, are there any questions about this color management stuff in Photoshop. I've now given you the gist of an expensive color management course, by the way. And really, in terms of what you need to know for this stuff, this is about what you need to know. Um, any, any questions about it before I move on here? I don't see any questions here. I think you've been pretty complete, Harold. Awesome. OK. So let me show you some basic, uh, let me show you some basic uh, LAB moves here. If I can get my mouse back, that is connected. Okay, thank you. So there is an important distinction if you look in the channels palette uh, between a having a channel selected and having it visible. Okay, right now I have the lightness channel, the black and white information selected. I also have it visible. What I'm going to do now is click the eyeball, um, there's fellas who can probably tell me what the eyeball indicator is called, but I call it the eyeball indicator. And that means that all channels are visible, but only the lightness channel is selected. That means that the operations I do on the lightness channel will only show on the lightness channel, but, but I'll see what it does across the channels. Note that the internal representation of all the channels is in grayscale. That doesn't mean that's the way it shows in your image, but that's the internal representation. What I'm now going to do is I'm going to use the color opponent property of the LAB channels to swap white and black with this image. So let me do that. Image, adjustment, invert. Invert swaps the values of the channel. So that, that's really pretty gosh darn amazing, if you ask me. One simple thing. OK, let's, let me note before I go further here that it's important, if you're going to do anything further with this image, that you reselect all the channels. If you don't do that, and I've not done that many times in my life, and you try and copy it over or do something, you're going to actually be copying over simply the grayscale representation of the L channel. Okay, let me go back in the history channel and show you a few other things. What happens if you invert all three channels and not just the L channel? Image, adjustment, invert. Okay, you get a pretty different look. This is like a science fiction flower with blue instead of the one with red. Sure, white and black have been swapped because you've swapped the L channel, but you've also inverted the other channels. Okay. Um, okay, let's go back and let's invert the A channel. 
Again, I'm eyeballing all the channels. Image, adjustment, invert. Okay, I just swapped reds and greens. Okay. And let's go back and swap the B channel. Okay, just swapped yellows and blues. Let me just show let me just show that again just for the heck of it. See the tips of this flower are kind of a pale greenish yellow. They become a kind of pale bluish blue. Any questions about these inversions? I know this is kind of mind blowing. Actually, uh, Barbara has a question. Uh, when you jump from Lightroom to fo Photoshop, all this still works? You bet. The thing to take, yes, absolutely. The thing you have to be careful about is to look in the Lightroom preferences and make sure you're taking in your raw files as ProPhoto RGB. Okay, otherwise, I mean, it's not, again, if you're taking them in, in Adobe RGB, that's not so terrible. There's really not a whole lot of difference between ProPhoto and, and Adobe RGB, but there is a big difference between both of those and sRGB. So just take care to bring in your images from Camera Raw into Lightroom or, or via Adobe Camera Raw at the highest uh, gamut you can. Okay, uh, questions about the inversion process on channel specifically? No. Okay. No. I think awesome. you're doing great. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, so let's take a look at the equalization adjustment, which there, there are some other adjustments that are usable with, um, with LAB, but the two biggies are, are, um, inversion and equalization. So what happens if you equalize the L channel? Image, adjustment, equalize. By the way, the adjustments are all on the image adjustments menu. So the, the equalize adjustment, the idea behind equalize is let's take whatever the thing is on the channel and bring it to the max. So whites go white, grays go gray. It's interesting with, uh, with Equalize on the lightness channel because whatever was underlying an image is, is brought out there. I mean, it looked pretty pure white before, but actually I know by doing this that there is a fair amount of gray and by white. Can't really see that by eye on the monitor, but there it is. Um, let's, a little more interesting, let's Equalize the A channel image adjustment equalize okay uh, what this is useful for besides be creating psychedelic Andy Warhol images is which I don't underestimate by the way I like doing that uh, you can use touches of this to do color emphasis and rendering in an image because the underlying shapes are the same. So it becomes pretty easy to paint things in. So let's uh, invert the B, let's equalize the B channel. Image adjustments, equalize. Okay. Uh, please keep in mind here that before you can use the image, you have to make sure that all channels are selected, not just the one you operated on. I just selected all the channels. And you also are gonna have to convert it back to RGB. Go image mode RGB, like that, okay? So before I move on to showing you one of the interesting applications of LAB, I want to show you how my LAB action works. Then I'm gonna come back and show you how to install it. But as long as we've been doing these adjustments, this is a great time for just showing you how it works, okay? So what I have on my actions panel here is Lab Action by Harold Davis. 
to use the lab action by Harold Davis, you have to start with an image that's in, in lab. So I'm gonna convert us back to LAB color here. And now I have our image in lab. What I'm also gonna do is make the image a little smaller so there's more room to see on the screen what's happening. And I'm going to click this button, lab action by Harold Davis. So what I've done here is I've taken my image and I've created a palette of possibilities. Every single inversion or equalization by itself or in pairs is now shown here as a uh, Andy Warhol palette of what can be done with these things. Okay, just gonna sh shut the channels palette for the moment to so make more room up here and the way I use these is to copy parts of them and make as a palette of possibilities because I have all the, first of all, I look at it and I say, well, you know, that version on black is pretty cool. Let me do something with it. So that's a possibility. But also I say, well, you know, I like, uh, I like, I, I, I like the wingtip here. Let me uh, copy it over and paste in a little bit of wing action just to, uh, you know, just, just to show you what I mean. Uh, okay, come on. That wasn't such a good. Uh, didn't do such a good job of dragging there. We'll try it again. Okay, so I have the, okay, I knew, I, I should have known I was gonna need the layers palette. I have the uh, B equalization on top here. I can put a layer mask on it, layer mask, hide all, and I can, I can paint in with using the brush tool, I can uh, paint in some wings. I generally, and that will amplify the color. If you're not interested in there, there it's off, there it's on. Let's let's exaggerate the impact. I was doing that at 14%. Let's put it at a higher percent so you can really see it. If you're not interested in, ex in an exaggerated attempt, I usually don't paint in LAB equalizations at greater than about 20%. 20, uh, 20%. So questions about this before I move on? Uh, yes, Inger has a question. Can the L channel be used for keeping the background completely white when doing the high key pictures? Well, I, I, that's a great question and the answer is yes. Yes, it absolutely can because you can use the L channel to, uh, uh, to, you can use a curve adjustment on the L channel to maintain a whiter white on, the, on a white background. That's one of the techniques that I'll be visiting, in fact, on Thursday in the uh, advanced processing section of the, of the uh, flowers webinar. Yes, absolutely. Good question. And Jim has the question, can you um, do this in spots? And I think maybe he's talking about layers with layer masks and painting. Yeah, ha let's have a look at the layer mask I just created over here. So um, that's a spot. Right? Right. Well, those little white dots are what's being hidden uh, because it's a, well, actually, it's a hide all layer mask. So the little white dots are revealing the layer underneath. So the right. little so that, tiny that's bit. That's painting, painting in controlled spots would be a fair way to describe that. Correct. So, yeah, yes is the answer. And uh, Carrie wants to know which of your books give us the most current teachings of lab? <laughs> well, it's hard to beat the first Photoshop dark room, dark room book. That's the book where I really took on LAB most. We, we are very pleased with the sections that we've written in the uh, New Garden Photography book 
that you see the garden photography book is 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 much more than garden photography really because the first part of the book it well the first part is about what are gardens the second part and why would i like them not that i need to write about that but i but i did the second part is how do you go out in the field and w deal with the lighting and exposure in gardens the third part is how do you take the gardens into your studio so that that was a great excuse for writing about lightbox photography at LAB. And the publisher wanted us to also. They chose an image for the cover that's a lightbox image, and we said, that's great. And then they said, yeah, we think it's great too, but you are going to show how to make this image, aren't you? And I said, of course I am. So, so probably the most step-by-step -step account of how to do this stuff is in the new book that's coming up. Uh, with the possible exception of the LAB material in the Photoshop darkroom, which we're very proud to say was written a long time ago by uh, internet standards and it's still a widely used and read book on uh, on Photoshop techniques. Yeah, Thanks, we've, al we've always tried to make the um, steps and things just sort of lowest common denominator. So no matter what version of Photoshop you're using, you'll have it. So. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm not the kind of person who always has to have the latest and greatest of anything. I, I'd rather do basic fundamental techniques about things. And uh, Na go ahead. Oh, Nancy would like to know, will your actions work with the perpetual version PS6? I believe, don't, don't, uh, don't hang draw and quarter me if this isn't true, but I believe so. It works. I, I, I have to admit, I'm a Luddite. I still love my CS2. You're going to laugh at me, everybody. But <laughs> it, yep, but it works with CS2. So um, I have a feeling it probably does. Yeah, I think so. There's nothing, you know, LAB and LAB um, uh, adjustments have been with Photoshop since the very beginning, since it is how fundamentally colors are are worked on in the in the software. There's nothing in the action that doesn't involve basic LAB um, modifications and moves. So I think so. But as I say, it's unsupported software. Okay, I'm going to close out these files. And let me show let me show one one more interesting thing you can do with LAB, and then I'm going to go and talk about how to how to find and install the action, and then I think we're going to wrap it up for the day. With more next time. Okay, let's see where was this? Um, where was this? Uh, I know I had it in here somewhere. Ba -ba -ba. Actually, while you're looking for that, yeah, please. Uh, Go ahead. Joe, Joe has a question. Hi, Joe. What is your typical storage cost for a total of all copies, archives of an image? <laughs> storage <laughs> costs. Well, I mean, we've got about 100 terabytes of data. We use network attached storage boxes here. Um, yeah, we don't put things up on the cloud because Harold's images for starters, sometimes they're gigabytes. They're so huge and um, it would take hours just to upload things. So we have uh, wonderful little black boxes that have hold eight, 10, 12 terabytes of information. And I think at this point we have eight of them. That's about right. Yeah. Yeah, the biggest one at this point is what a 60 terabyte box. Uh, Joe right. asked cost in bytes, not dollars. Ah, yeah, I have no clue. <laughs> Lots. <laughs> Lots. I mean, as Phyllis says, I don't, you know, look, Photoshop gives you grief if you go above two gigabytes on a layered file. It gives you grief in the following sense. It won't save it as a straight PSD file. It'll only save it as a PSB, large document format file. And the really annoying thing, the really annoying thing that Photoshop does, it's, uh, is that it doesn't tell you that it won't save it until it goes through the whole long process of trying to save it. And at the very end, it says this file is too big. Why it can't tell you that before it tries uh, or why it can't just switch it to PSB itself, I, I couldn't tell you. But yeah, many of my layered files are bigger than two gigs. 
you Thank know, you. of course, it depends what camera they come out of. The more recent the current is, the larger the resolution file. And, you know, there are different uses. Obviously, there's no point in having a high resolution file for display on the internet. And you save everything. You save every step of every image that you make. So if you ever need to go back and correct something or do something different for a different purpose, you can just backstep yourself. I try to do that, certainly. Okay, we have here a nice, uh, a nice uh, star trail image uh, photographed in the Saline Valley near the Nevada border near Death Valley in California back in the back in the back in my wandering days shall we say okay and let me let me switch this into lab color let me duplicate my layer layer duplicate layer and here's the duplicate layer and what i'm going to do on the duplicate layer is I'm going to do LAB sharpening. So the point here is to sharpen just the lightness channel, not the black and white channels. To really see what we're going to do, what it does is you have to move in pretty close. Okay. So there we go. Now I'm going to point out that this image, like many star trail images, when you get up close and we're looking at it at about 250%, is, is a bit noisy. So if you sharpened the thing overall, it would look ugly. But what I do is I sharpen and I just use an old fashioned sharpening tool, the unsharp mask. And I think you can even see that on your, on your screen. Okay, so going back to my come on. I'm having some tr grief here with my computer. Move it, computer. I seem to have no okay, let's see. Let's move this a little smaller. Now it's worth noting about sharpening while I'm waiting, while I'm waiting to get control back, um, that, okay. Hmm. You have a frustrated photographer here. I can't, I can't seem to access my, my screen to do this, but I think everybody saw how much sharper it got. And the point is that the eye goes to where it looks sharper. So you can use LAB sharpening and masking to creatively control where people go, oh, I see the problem. Okay. So I go, okay. And here's the difference it made. Okay, let's look at that up close. It's pretty dramatic and it's also still reasonably attractive. What I could do is I could take down the overall sharpening layer like that if I wanted, so it doesn't have to be at 100%. What I could also do is I could put a layer mask on it hide all and so maybe i'd like the foreground to not be quite so sharp but i want my star trails to be sharpened i could put a, a gradient mask on like that and then i could have the star trails sharp this this for when i'm sharpening for visual emphasis there are three kinds of sharpening there's input sharpening output sharpening and there's creative sharpening for visual emphasis when I do creative sharpening for visual emphasis, for example, the center of a flower or star trails or something like this, LAB, L channel sharpening is the only way I use. I find it much better, much more attractive than any of the commercial products out there for sharpening. Are there any worth the price of admission for this alone? Are there any questions about this before I move on? Uh, Barbara was wondering if you can just walk us through that again. Okay. So I, um, I started with an image in LAB color. Okay. First you have to convert it to LAB color. 
Then I duplicated my layer, layer, duplicate layer, okay? Then I went to my channels panel. I made sure the lightness channel was selected, the only channel selected, but all three channels are eyeballed. And then I applied the unsharp mask, which is one of the basic old tools of Photoshop. And it's worth taking a look as I do this at the unsharp mask settings, which are much higher than one you would use um, for normal unsharp mask settings in RGB color. The way you set this control is you set the threshold and radius first, and then you set the amount. The amount normally should be between 50 and 100%. You don't really want to go over 100%. And then threshold of 10, radius of 7.8. Roughly speaking, the radius should be somewhere between 5 and 10 for this kind of thing. Threshold says, is there any level below which you're not going to do the sharpening? The radius says, what's the width of the sharpening you're going to do? The amount is the one you want to play with here. So if I boosted the amount up to up to 223%, uh, that, that is much sharper, but it actually looks pretty god-awful technical term. Okay, so I have it uh, at 70%. I click OK. I make sure that all three channels are selected. I put on a layer mask, layer, layer mask, hide all. And I paint in, in this case, using the gradient tool, the parts of it that I actually want the sharpening to apply. I look at it and I say, hey, maybe that's a little bit too much. So I take it down to 70%. When I'm happy with what I've done, I archive the layered file, I layer it down, and I save another version. Everybody okay with this? No questions. I think you got it. Okay. So going back to Harold's action, yeah, it's nice to talk about myself in the third person, right? Um, I'm going to go to my website. So this is digitalfieldguide.com. Okay. On the about menu, there's interviews, profiles, and links. And uh, Phyllis, when you, if you send out a information to people, you might want to include this link in it. Absolutely. And down towards the bottom of this um, lengthy list of stuff is um, Harold's LAB Action. This is the version from the uh, beginning of 2019, which is the most recent version. And it, there's a README file you can download, which tells you how to install it. Then you click here to download the zip file. Okay. Now, you can save this wherever you want to save it. You know, you can save it in downloads. Um, I've already saved it in Harold's lab action. When you, when you expand the zip file, you get both a readme text and a .atn file. Okay. Let's go, let's go back to Photoshop. In Photoshop, what you want to do uh, is you want to make sure the Actions panel is open. Now, normally, when you open the Actions panel the first time, it's going to come up not in button mode. So it's going to look something like this, OK? Can everyone see my actions panel here? I'm going to expand it out. It looks like a bit of a bit of a nasty mess, right? So what you what you can do to make this a little more manageable is you click the little menu here, and you turn it into button mode. So to load my action with that same menu, you go load action, and it will open up a dialog and you can go find what you just downloaded, download, 
Harold's lab action and you select it, you click open and it's going to appear on the, on the button menu. I, I do urge you to use the actions uh, panel in button mode for, for sanity's sake. And really the only thing you need to know about using this is that you need to have an open file in LAB before you can before you click it. It, it. And presumably the smart thing to do is to make that open file in LAB a copy of your original file. You don't necessarily want to be fooling around with the original one as you fool around with LAB, as in fool around with one thing at one time, or as my uh, grandma liked to say, with one rear end, you can only dance at one wedding. So, well, anyhow, I don't know where I was going with that, but there you go. Uh, I, I think this is really pretty self-explanatory and it's in the readme file as well, but I do have to emphasize the point that this is free software and not supported, <laughs> please. Uh, it, it basically duplicates the effects you can get by taking uh, channels and applying all the equalizations and inversions that are possible to them in LAB color. I think I've covered everything on my outline for this. I, I look forward and hope to see you next time, next Saturday in the uh, advanced uh, class. Let me go back to my uh, presentation at this point and run through the rest of it. And then, uh, then we'll call it a wrap um, and think about what questions you may have as, uh, as, as you go, as we uh, continue here. Okay. Uh, all righty. So I, I again, I was demonstrating various ways you can apply the uh, moves we've seen, the equalizations and inversions. Of course, when you begin to apply those equalizations and inversions and then bring the vast power of Photoshop's blending modes for uh, channels into play, it becomes almost exponentially more possibilities. In fact, sometimes my problem with LAB color is un uh, it is understanding all the different way, things I can do and saying, hey, which of these are worth doing, which are not. This is a paper bark tree bark. And so it went here, then it went here, then it went here, and then it went here. Here's a, uh, this was an illustration, I think, from one of the books on what some of the common LAB channel inversions are. LAB channel equalizations. And we just did that. And we're asking, are there any questions? I'm happy to answer questions. Um, actually, I don't have any questions at the moment, just uh, questions about where can we sign up for the next one? And I'm putting in uh, links. It's next Saturday uh, at 11 o'clock. We're going to pick up. Well, I'll do a quick, maybe five minute review of the salient points here. I, I won't cover sharpening again, I don't think, because that's a separate topic in and of itself. We'll do a quick uh, salient review of, of inversions, equalization, of converting to LAB, inversions, equalizations, and how to run my macro. And then we'll pick up and do some, uh, some really fun stuff from there. Here's uh, contact information for me. Great. Oh, um, Mark would like to know, next week, would you show some more examples using lab techniques with portraits and other landscape images in addition to flowers? You bet. Not so much portraits, probably. Uh, you know, I'll see if I have some good ones, but certainly landscapes. And Jim says, thank you for keeping these inexpensive so I can learn from you. You're very welcome. I'm happy to do it. And uh, Carrie says, Harold, I cannot thank you enough for generously sharing and teaching your brilliant lab method. For me, it's the most exciting work you do. Brava. Oh, so thank you so much, Carrie. It's so good to hear from you, too. And Irene says, thank you for your generosity and clear teaching. Thanks, Irene means a lot to me uh, that people, people like this. So thank you, thank you so much. 
And uh, Craig wants to know what's the sub menu under about at Digital Field Guide to find the action? Uh, it's interviews, profiles, and links. And uh, actually, Harold, if you could go back to the previous uh, slide just to show where they, people can submit their work for review if they want to have fun playing with lab and send something that Harold can see. Yeah, it's helpful to me if you, uh, just to keep things straight, if you would tag it. That's at Harold L. Davis there. Right. That's the most important tag. The others help me understand if it's an LAB image as opposed to one of the ones from one of the flower webinars. Of course, exactly. it could be both. Then you get to use both sets of tags. It's true. Oh, I'm getting a lot of thanks here, Harold. Oh, good, good, good. It helps. It helps fuel us to go on. I mean, it's the truth is that uh, Phyllis is a hero here. And, you know, getting up and then doing this and getting ourselves together to doing it and getting the kids to know they can't come in and say, where's my breakfast and all this <laughs> stuff. is. <laughs> they have to get their own cocoa. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, William says, thank you for a great class. It's always a pleasure to be part of your class as a great learning experience. Bill, thanks a lot. Or how, is, how, how are you doing in Missouri? And uh, Anne says, very absorbing and challenging in a good way. Thanks for paving the way for all of us. Your enthusiasm and creativity are inspiring and your playfulness is delightful. Thanks. Thanks. And Martin says, great stuff, Harold and Phyllis. Thanks for your generosity. And Ronald says, excellent presentation. Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone. This is just so lovely. Thanks very much. See you next week. And... Uh... I hope you enjoyed this video and found it informative. Be creative and stay mighty.